chilling tales for dark nights. Facing Fears Narrated by Jesse Cornett It's turning dusk now, and even though the sun is setting quickly in the west, I can see that the county trunk leading my destination hasn't changed much after all this time. The crooked trees overhanging this death trap of road still drown out the sunlight and the rusted and forgotten remains of decades-old machinery and old furniture still littered the ditches. You know, where you would expect to hear bird calls, rustling wind, or the occasional twig snapping beneath the deer's hooves, there's still silence. And driving out here, I'm filled with an insurmountable dread as if some danger lurks right around the corner. In fact, if it weren't for my automatic locks and windows, for my blaring radio, this trip would be downright intolerable. I'm on my way to the castle. A hulking monstrosity of jagged sheet metal and wooden planks planted in the middle of rural Amherst, Wisconsin by a family of cattle farmers in 1903. The original building had been a slaughterhouse and the family had lived out of a cramped three-room cabin on the south side of the structure. They lived that way until they suddenly disappeared in 1931, leaving everything but their 1922 Cadillac Victoria behind. Closest neighbors in their day had lived nearly 10 miles away, so the only sign of their disappearance was their absence at the Sunday market, where they usually sold their meats. Years went by, and no heir for the property could be found, so it sat and stagnated for over 50 years. And in that time, the place developed quite a reputation, becoming a sort of haunted house in the area. The castle lent itself to rumors. Creaking rafters, rusted cattle hooks, nearly silence were enough to convince most that the place was haunted. And many speculated that the original owners had been murdered, and that they were in fact the ones haunting the old slaughterhouse. Others argued that there was a malevolent presence there long before the people showed up, and that the family was simply driven away. Whatever really happened, one thing's for sure. Over the span of 50 years, the castle became a hot spot for the local teenagers. And flock after flock, they'd visit the slaughterhouse at night or dare each other to try and spend the night there. Everybody wanted to catch a glimpse of the spirits roaming the grounds. Things went on this way up until 1982, when the property was finally seized by the state and put back on the market. Now at that time, it was purchased by my father, who had been completely unaware of the place's lurid history. And he recalls being baffled by the absence of bidders, considering the rock-bottom asking price for such a large parcel of land. I couldn't understand it, my father told me. Acres and acres of perfectly good hunting and fishing land, and nobody wanted it. And although the castle's history was eventually revealed to my father, he refused to believe any of it. Even when the occasional teenager would sneak onto his property to try and see a ghost, he'd just shoo him away, blaming all the local hysteria on old wives' tales. And my father did not believe in ghosts. And he was certainly not worried about evoking their wrath when he decided he would renovate the old slaughterhouse in 1984, the year after I was born. And within a year, my father and a few uncles had transformed the place, turning it into a deer cabin and storage shed the size of a small house. And they had managed to salvage much of the material that had been used to build the original slaughterhouse, including the gigantic cattle hanging hooks in the rear of the shed, but it also added some new things including a brick chimney, garage doors, and modern windows with insulation. The new building was a sight to behold, and when it was officially given its name in 1985, it was hardly recognizable. Now, over the years, word spread that the property had been sold, and fewer teens showed up looking for ghosts. 
Instead of a haunted house, the place became a meeting ground for my family. In the summer months, the castle played host to family reunions, blackberry picks, and barbecues, which always ended with a bonfire. And it was at these bonfires that I first learned to connect the castle to a paranormal activity. My Uncle Danny was quite a storyteller. With all the kids gathered around the fire, he would tell tales of strange things he saw and heard while staying alone overnight at the trailer. He'd lean in close to the fire, his elbows on his knees, and he'd speak in a low voice so that we had to get really close to hear the stories. He told us about rattling noises and ragged breathing he often heard at night, about the shadows, blacker than night, that crept along the walls when he woke. And Danny always ended his stories the same way. There's something bad in that cabin, he would say, waving us in closer. Whatever's there, it's always watching, waiting for you to fall asleep. Waiting until it can sneak up on you and... And at that point, Danny would scream or yell or scare the bejesus out of all of us. Now, more than one occasion, his jump stories would make one of the kids cry, and he would try to console everyone by telling them he was making it up. As I get closer and closer to the castle myself, though, it's really difficult to believe him. And as I round the final curve of the old county trunk, the monstrosity comes into sight and rises up before me like something out of a nightmare, just like it always does. But this time, it's getting dark. And unlike the last time I was here, I don't have a friend with me. And as I pull into the driveway, squashing grass that hasn't been cut for weeks, I start to second guess my choice to come here. And what if my car dies? What if I get stuck out here with, without my radio or automatic locks to save me? What then? But before I can answer myself, I realize that it's too late to second guess. I'm here. And I pull up in the makeshift lot of the castle, some 20 feet from its front entrance. And at that moment, I remember what happened here 17 years ago. And at that time, Outside of hunting season, my father had been renting the castle on the people on weekends. Many of the people who paid came to see the ghosts. My father insists to this day that they really came to appreciate the land. And whatever the case may be, business was booming until a certain day in 1987 when a group of 12 college students rented the cabin, leaving an awful mess behind themselves. And when my father arrived the next morning to check them out, he found the place deserted, food, garbage, bottles strewn everywhere, shattered table lamps, liquor-stained carpeting, and overturned furniture told the tale. And chairs had been flung from one end of the cabin to the other. And dressers had been overturned, their contents dumped on the floor, and the place reeked of rum and whiskey. Now, thinking the students had intentionally trashed the place, my father was enraged. He traversed the entire cabin in a fury, assessing the damage, but he reached the back staircase and that anger was replaced by shock and horror. From under the staircase reached a pale human hand, limp and caked in blood. I almost had a heart attack, my father recalled. The only way to get under the staircase is through a trap door in the rear bedroom. I never told anybody about it. The hand belonged to a young man, unconscious at first, who came to when his lifeless arm was nudged by my father. He was as white as chalk. He kept trying to tell me something, but he was so jittery that he, he couldn't make out the words. And the sheriff arrived moments later thanks to my father, and the whole incident was blamed on drugs. <laughs> and the boy's identity was never disclosed, and the student renters were never heard from again. But the memory of that day lives on. My father still doesn't believe in ghosts, but he agrees that something strange happened that night and doesn't rule out the chance that the students were scared away. Now I sit here, staring at the castle through the windshield of my car. And even though I'm much older now, the bonfire stories and weekend rentals far behind me, I must admit, 
That maturity has not lessened the castle's effect on my nerves. Even with my doors securely locked and my radio on in the background, I still feel a chill run down my spine. The feeling you get when something unseen is watching you. I feel like the castle and these horrible darkness shrouded woods that surround it are watching me. Waiting for me to get out of the car. And warning me to leave. But I'm not leaving. I've been terrified of the castle ever since I was a sophomore in high school. That year, on a cold marsh night, I led a bunch of my friends to the cabin for a night of party. And by that time, I had heard the ghost stories from my uncle, and I knew all about the student found under the back staircase. But I'd never taken much stock in the lore. Besides, I'd been at the castle with a dozen of my friends. As far as I had been concerned, the ghost would just bring it on. I'm back in the present. I'm sick of being scared. I wanted to get over my fears. This could be the hardest thing that I ever do. The thoughts I'm entertaining are anything but comforting. And with a deep breath, I cautiously turn down my radio and unbuckle my seatbelt. And after a quick glance at the entrance of the castle, I reluctantly turn off my car engine and grab a flashlight off my passenger seat. And gripping the light tightly in my right hand, I make my way up out of the car into the building, my heart threatening to pound a hole through my chest. The sun is quickly disappearing into the west, and the sky is darkening over the top of the castle, casting shadows in all directions. I decide to try to make my way in the front entrance instead. And the shed is as sturdy as could be, but the way it creaks in the wind, you could swear it's about to fall down any second. Now beneath the porch, the skeletal remains of animals rot and decompose, left over from years gone by. Now there were so many cattle bones on the ground and in it, that when my father arrived, he became a joke that there were more bones than dirt here. Digging up all the bones could have taken years, so the cabin was built on supports instead. Now, crisscross slats cover the perimeter of the porch, shielding our precious eyes from the barbarity of the cabin's history. But to my family, however, it's home. Some home, I think to myself. This place is a nightmare, and the deer skulls have nothing to do with it. In March of 1999, when my friends and I arrived at the castle, with hopes of having a party, we didn't expect uninvited guests. But they had other plans. I had invited two dozen people to my party. Only half the friends on my list were able to come. But we made up for those who couldn't with friends of friends. None of my friends knew where the castle was or how to get there, so we met up in a parking lot on the outskirts of town. When everyone had arrived, our parade took off on the 15-mile journey to Amherst and ultimately the castle. On the way there, all I could think about was my recent breakup with a girlfriend I had grown to hate intensely. And I was ready to bust loose on that night to put the past behind me. The drive to the castle was fairly uneventful, and when we arrived at the monstrosity, it didn't take on the eerie, foreboding atmosphere it usually did. Everything actually seemed normal. Now, we had unpacked our cars, and I unlocked the front door of the cabin. Now, once we were all inside, I briefed everyone on the rules. Now, this isn't my cabin, I told everybody. If you find alcohol in here, leave it alone. <laughs> my father and his hunting buddies often left six packs of beer or bottles of hard liquor at the cabin. After a long night of hunting, they like to relax. And don't lock any of the inside doors. If something happens to any of you, we won't be able to help you. And dressers, reclining chairs, a TV, and a couch are neatly arranged, all facing to the east side of the castle. Windows on the right side of this half allow guests to see the overgrown yard to the east, but not directly. On the outside of these windows, there's a small crawl space. There's a bedroom on the far end of the trailer. This is the room with the trap door in it, leading to the underside of the trailer, where the college student was found hiding so many years ago. And a layer of red carpet conceals the door, but the carpet has never been tacked down in its corners, just in case somebody needs to use the door for you know, an emergency exit. We made our way into this cabin of ours without a care in the world except maybe to get drunk. 
I'm sure some of my friends were hoping to test out some birth control methods that night. It should have been a fun time. It only took 15 minutes for the situation to turn sour, however. By the time I had set up our music system, put in some pizzas and popcorn, and attempted to start the furnace, a friend of a friend had stolen two dozen bottles of beer from the refrigerator and had handed them out to others, saying they were his. Before I knew it, my friends were drunk off my father's beer and were running into things and falling down. Things went on like this for a while until my friend Chris noticed something moving outside the windows on the east side of the cabin. A pile of people gathered near the window to see what the fuss was about. Maybe it was the alcohol talking, but Chris swore he saw something. I headed to the window. Just then, everybody around it freaked out, running in all directions. A few ran to the front door and tried desperately to get it open, but to no avail. Some ran into the bedrooms and locked the doors. Damn it, I thought. I told them not to lock the doors. So I headed over to the window and I pressed my face up against it, trying to see through the dust and dirt smeared on it. And then I saw it. A black shape flitted across the yard outside, just inside my peripheral vision. I thought I was seeing things until it appeared again, and this time inside the shed walls, in the crawl space between the cabin and the jagged, cheap metal walls. Human-like in shape, but too dark to make out any features. Its outline was vague against the night sky and the darkness of the crawl space. And then it was gone. It had ducked into whatever hole it came from. I, I told everybody not to worry and that all the doors were locked. And just then, somebody pointed the front door out to me, where some idiot had flung it open and ran to their car, drunk, trying to get away. And I ran over to the porch door and started to shut it. Just then, a crash from the back porch turned everybody around in an instant, and one of the deer hanging hooks in the back had flung itself against the interior wall of the shed, damn near knocking the place over. And then a knocking came from the inside of the locked bedroom in the rear of the castle but not from the normal door. And it was coming from the trap door. And before I knew it, the people who had locked themselves inside that room, including Chris, were screaming so loud we couldn't hear the music in the background anymore. I peered into the bedroom and I saw everything how it had been when I arrived. But a lot of the people had taken off, including someone who was, had brought an SUV packed with eight people. But they left with three. This meant... We didn't have enough cars to take everybody home. Soon, people were seeing shapes all around the sides of the castle. Walls were shaking, and the deer hooks in the back had taken on a life of their own. The back bedroom door had shut, and it locked itself somehow. The pale blue light came from under it. The only lamps in the room were white. And about that time, we ended up leaving everything we brought there, figuring we'd pick it up the next day when it was light outside. I've never seen people so scared in my life. And then, we heard knocking coming from the back bedroom. We hesitated before going in, but once we did, saw that the carpet was pulled up in the trapdoor corner. And that's where the knocking was coming from. Sometimes it's funny how history repeats itself. But I'm not really laughing right now. I'm at the castle for real now. And it's dark. No more dusk. Not even twilight. It's pitch black out here. Now I'm standing in the living room. The place where we saw the shapes outside in the yard that cold March night. Now on this night, however, there are no strange shapes. And no rattling deer hooks or terrified friends. It's just my imagination. My car, and me. Now, I ended up staying at the castle for 40 minutes or so, checking everything out and trying to prove to myself that our shapes and noises were just our imagination all those years ago. My search turned up nothing, and I exited the castle, happy that I'd overcome my fears. And then a twig snapped to the left of me, and I've never started a car that fast since. The rubber from my tires is still glued to the old county trunk leading out there. I guess we can convince our minds that we're not scared. But our bodies don't always listen. 
And in any case, I think I'll overcome my fears of the castle in the daylight next time.